Good afternoon to one and all. Can you hear me well? Perfect. We even have a surprise visit from abroad. Today we will present the Art Nouveau exhibit in Barcelona and uh, as we do every year we will talk about the activities that will be held during the exhibit and also a speech on a specific topic of Art Nouveau. We will have Frances from Bona, the curator from the Camarasa year. Camarasa was not a very well-known uh, painter, but very important in Art Nouveau. This is the 16th uh, Art Nouveau exhibit in Barcelona. This means that we've been working for quite a long time on this, and we're so proud to have it again face-to-face -face after these two years uh, of these health issues. First, we will hear from Xavier Llobet, the president of the Association of uh, uh, Traders of the Right Side of Eixample, Cor Eixample. Xavier? Good afternoon and welcome to this presentation of the 16th Art Nouveau exhibition of Barcelona. This exhibition, uh, well, it's the 16th and we've had some virtual exhibitions uh, and we organize these through Cora Champla, the urban landscape and also the different entities that are, uh, you know, part of the neighborhood exhibition, so to speak, the uh, city festivity. This neighborhood didn't have a festivity, but within the festivity, we have the Art Nouveau exhibition. And this year, uh, and this is new, we have our own space in Cora Champla. We have a space where you will see that we're already in the street, in Street Arago, 317. So Cora Champla has its own space. And within this exhibition, what we're trying to coordinate is the handicrafts, the traders, uh, uh, restaurants, and workshops of all different kinds uh, for different people, different ages, uh, so that you can all enjoy these activities. What it's very important is that after the pandemic, uh, for this exhibition to be up and running again and uh, trade is again for the neighbors uh, in the neighborhood we want it to we want to make it easy for you everything around the corner we the traders we went through very tough times some some were not able to resist and some others were still here but whatever you need it's in your neighborhood it's for you available and uh, finally, I would like to talk about the collaboration uh, project with the oncology unit in the Valdebron Hospital. Uh, with the sales of some small glasses, they are not Art Nouveau glasses, but you will see the exhibition with the other lenses. You will be able to uh, contribute uh, to the creation of the Children's Oncology Unit in the Valdebron Hospital. In Champla, the trade, and in Cora Champla, the trade will always be for the Champla neighborhood. The Champla neighborhood and our area, because Cora Champla, it's uh, it, within different avenues, Corsica Street, Trafalgar Street. We're always at uh, the heart of Art Nouveau. We are always at the heart, and uh, that's why we can organize an Art Nouveau exhibition like this. And it was all thanks to the Catalan Institute and the Urban Landscape. We will always be here for you and the exhibition will also be here for you although maybe we will have to change uh, its place but we will always be in the neighborhood so god leave uh, the uh, exhibition the neighborhood and barcelona 
long live all of this. Well, as Xavier said, uh, the Art Nouveau exhibition in Barcelona, it's organized by the Traders uh, Association of the Right Part of uh, Eixample, and also the Urban Landscape uh, Institute from the City Council of Barcelona. Because since 1997, we were coordinating the Art Nouveau route in Barcelona. And this is why we have been collaborating, because we are involved with everything that has to do with Art Nouveau. Sometimes we're scared, but we always do it. And there is another part of the City Council of Barcelona that always helps us to organize the exhibition, and which is rooted in the territory, which is the Eixample neighborhood. I'm talking about the Art Nouveau exhibition. It's also the festivity of the right wing of Le Champla. And we have the pleasure to have Isabel Payeja with us. She is councillor of the district of Eixample, and she will address a few words for you. Thank you very much. Uh, just some brief words to thank from the Eixample district, uh, to thank the organizers, uh, the Urban Landscape Institute and Cora Eixample, with my dear friend Xavi Yuvet. This Art Nouveau exhibition is an example for other places of the neighborhood and the city. The 16th edition, which is a happiness for all of us. We're so happy that we can celebrate it face to face because during two years, we did it only virtually. And it was difficult to do that. I represent the trade in Eixample, and I know the efforts done by Cora Eixample to be able to have these exhibitions online. So do Doing this face to face is pure happiness for everyone. The visitors of the exhibition, for us who are part of the administration, and I wish that uh, this exhibition, for this exhibition to be very successful, and also the future exhibitions. Thank you. Good. Next, we will move on to the essence of today's event, which is a brief description of the most important activities that will take place in the Art Nouveau exhibition. Jordi Paris from the Urban Landscape Institute, a dear friend of mine, will tell you about it. It's important to talk about this summary. It will be a brief summary, but you will see how many people, how many entities are involved in the exhibition and how many people want to to make a success out of uh, this exhibition. Jordi. The exhibition is back face to face after two online editions and uh, during this weekend uh, between Diagonal and Valencia we will hold the exhibition and the little train will be between Brook and Girona Street. That's the only change. Every year we focus on a different topic. We focus on uh, personality or a building uh, and today we want to focus on Armen Anglada Camarasa, a universal Catalan painter. It's 150 anniversary since his birth. And uh, today we will talk about Anglada Camarasa, a great international painter uh, on behalf of Dr. Von Bona. He's the curator of the Anglada year, and he will tell us about this author. As every year, we will also uh, of course, this year we're focusing on Anglada Camarasa, and uh, boys and girls will be able to collect stamps in the different uh, shops in Eixample and different points in Eixample, such as the Corcanut uh, bookshop, uh, everything devoted to Anglada Camarasa. We also have the Art Nouveau uh, La Pedrera uh, Giant uh, exhibition. We will see them in the streets, and we will also see them in the exhibition standing still. And we will be able to do a workshop there for you to paint your giant uh, 
characters. We will also have a light and color of the nine hunters. The collaborators of the exhibition are here. They are dressed uh, uh, in the modernist style. And uh, they will work as uh, they uh, do uh, in, uh, uh, as they did in the modernist period, you know. they will uh, be there on um, Saturday and on Sunday. They will be focusing on fashion, but with lots of historic uh, rigor. The Terrassa Textile Entity has always collaborated. Uh, this year, they haven't been able to be present, but they are very rigorous with a historic value of clothes. So it's not just a catwalk, it's about showing how how the modernist period was through the clothes. We will also have the uh, show for children uh, where we will read stories for kids, for kids uh, to uh, make their imagination fly. And uh, something else that's new, the presence uh, of a car, Ford A, from 1929. Uh, from uh, the uh, firemen of Barcelona. They came here before the pandemic, and again, they will do the uh, demonstration of the water pump. I I, I recommend you to go there. They are uh, using the water pump to put a fire off, and they will do a real demonstration uh, to see how this works. But uh, you will see, you won't need to go to the gym after that because you will uh, do lots of exercise. More innovations. We have uh, uh, different municipalities coming here to show their Art Nouveau. We also have Odellas de Leon stand. Uh, They will do a presentation on Friday. And uh, those that will come again, the Art Nouveau route of Barcelona, also the Art Nouveau from Europe, uh, the City Council of Terrassa, the Council of Barcelona, the City Council of Sardagnola, with the Sardagnola Museum, uh, Melilla, Cardedeu with their route, uh, also Mataró, Argentona, and Canet de Mat uh, will come, the Consortium of Baix Llobregat, uh, Alcor, City Council, among other entities, will be present. And this year, we have a website of the Art Nouveau uh, exhibition, Fira Modernista Barcelona cat. You will find all of the activities with the timetables and everything, because I've just briefly summarized and probably I've skipped a few things. And there you will see what you can uh, do during these days. And we also have uh, a summary of all of the exhibitions that have been done, the virtual exhibitions and the other previous 16, 15 exhibitions. So it's a good uh, documentation of the art Novo exhibition. We will have the little train going by. We will also have the old cars route on Sunday. We will also uh, be uh, having a workshop to paint like Anglada Camarasma. You can uh, go and take a picture with our Art Nouveau decoration, uh, the juggling uh, ex- uh, show, and many other things for you to learn about Art Nouveau. We will expect you all at the exhibition. Okay, as you can see, there will be lots of activities for everybody, for all ages. And since we're talking about ages, I would like to say that yesterday afternoon, we gave the awards of uh, uh, 
the two uh, um, floral uh, activities uh, of the Art Nouveau exhibition. And we saw how uh, all of the kids in the neighborhood uh, are uh, real uh, poets. Uh, this is a, uh, these are floral games. Uh, it's a contest uh, with uh, poetry. And you will be able to see the poems, to see the awards. All of the poems were quite good. But I would like to underline that secondary school students uh, drew really created very passionate and interesting po poems. OK, let's get into the most important part today, which is the conference given by Dr. Frances Fombona. He is the curator of the Anglada Camarasa year. Anglada Camarasa, a great international painter. That's the title. Doctor, you have the floor. I'm going to talk for quite a long time, so I'm going to sit down. You know, I'm elderly, I'm an elderly, so I'll sit down. OK, before in the presentation, it's been said that Anglada Camarasa was a painter that uh, is not that well known, popularly speaking. And maybe this is true. Maybe Rusignol Casas are more popularly known, Mir Nunez. But uh, at a commercial level, at a market level, I would say it's the contrary. I would say that when there is a picture of Anglada Camarasa in an auction, we can see that prices are much higher than, uh, well, compared to any of these well-known painters. And this has always been the, same, the, the case. And uh, you, will, you will see that this was the case while he was alive. Anglada was born in Barcelona, and he was born on the 11th of September, 1871. And uh, he was not especially Catalanist painter. He wasn't anti-Catalanist, but instead of being in the Renaissance world, in the more militant uh, world, he was more from the Republican world. He was in the La Publicidad uh, newspaper, which was the Republican newspaper. And then in his family, like in many other cases, uh, well, his family didn't want him to be a painter, especially his mother. And this was very painful for him. And when he was young, he uh, wanted uh, to flee from Barcelona. He didn't want to be in Barcelona because his family was not supporting him. And uh, at the beginning, uh, they weren't paying too much attention uh, to him. This is the oldest picture of him. Uh, it's from Villanova y la Geltrú, because in this period, he was going more to Villanova and to Arbusias more than in Barcelona, where his home was. He was a student of Tomás Moragas. He is a painter focusing on Moroccan topics, a dear friend of Maria Fortun, who had an impact on him because at the beginning, Anglada, and by the way, he was also a student from Modest Urge, but, uh, well, I've taken out some uh, slides because otherwise it would be too long. But besides Tomas Moragas, he uh, considered himself a student of Modest Urgell, much before Modest Urgell became a dean of the landscape of the fine arts official school in Barcelona. When Urgell became the dean there, and that was in 1894, Anglada was going to Paris. Uh, so he was a student of the private academy of Modest Urgell. 
and uh, he didn't follow his style too closely. As you will see, he followed his own path. He was a good friend of uh, Victor Balaguer. We don't know why, but Victor Balaguer was a well-known personality at that time. He was one of the important names of the beginning of uh, the Renaissance. He was a romantic historian, a poet, uh, and a politician. He was a minister, uh, MP, and, uh, and Glada was going a lot, a lot to Villanova because of this, uh, because uh, Victor Balaguer, and at that time he was also a senator, and he was elected for the Villanova district, although he was not from Villanova. That's why he went to Villanova. Anglada met uh, this uh, person. Uh, he was a little bit aside of the world because he was very old at that time. We're talking about uh, the last 10 years of the 19th century. And at that time, the predominant personalities were Santiago Rusignol, Ramon Casas, and all the people from uh, Art Nouveau. But he was a good friend of Victor Balaguer. Victor Balaguer gave him one of his uh, first pictures when Anglada was still no one. He saw that Balaguer was uh, opening to thank Villanova a uh, temple of knowledge, which was the Victor Balaguer Library Museum, which is still up and running, and it's an extraordinary entity that many people do not know about. But that was the first art museum that was done in Catalonia, starting from scratch starting from a new architectonic project, everything paid by Victor Balaguer. And at that time, Balaguer opened uh, the doors of the knowledge with his art collection, with his private uh, library, and he asked uh, the artists to collaborate. Many artists collaborated, and Anglada uh, gave him this uh, picture. Uh, it's a large uh, canvas of uh, 1890, more or less, and it is painted uh, in Arbusias. It represents Arbusias. This is Anglada painting the forests in Arbusias. Anglada also met Victor Balaguer in Arbusias because Victor Balaguer knew an important family in Arbusias. They had a house in Arbusias and uh, this is why Victor Balaguer was uh, in uh, an environment which was not the main environment of Barcelona. He was also a friend of Sebastià Junent, uh, one of the first protectors of Pablo Picasso. On the left, we have a paint of Sebastià Junent, and on the right, a picture of Anglada Camarasa in the forests of Arbusia. It's exactly the same place, the same corner, the same stones. And Junyin was a, a very important personality at that time. He was a well-known painter, and he was also an important art theor theory expert. Uh, he knew a lot about it. Uh, and they did a manifesto together, but I'm not going to uh, work. I'm not going to talk about that here. This is one of the typical paints of Anglada at that time, also from the uh, forests in Arbusias. This paint is now in the National Museum of Habana in Cuba. Men, it's been there for many years. And in these pictures, Anglada was very recent because he wanted to do an exhibition of this in Salabares. Uh, he was a very young paint. Uh, he was not living in Barcelona. He did the exhibition with this kind of uh, paints, high-quality paints, but very different from the paints at that time.
that time because people who were buying landscape at that time, they were used to Vaireda, Urgell, and different kind of painter styles. Also Martí Alzina, Torres Casana, all these kind of painters. And they were totally different from this kind of style. But this exhibition that was done in uh, 94 was totally unforeseen. And I'm glad that, you know, complained because he said, I'm young, I have no resources. I put so much effort. I printed invitations, catalogs, but nothing was successful. It was not successful at all. And this happened because of an extra artistic reason. And uh, that exhibition was done exactly at the same time. And in the same Sala Pares, Ramon Casas was uh, showing Garroteville. And uh, the Garrot uh, pa paint was so eye-catching at that time, not only because of artistic reasons, but also because of what it represented, because this was one of the last public uh, executions in the city of Barcelona. And this is why uh, Barcelona wanted to focus on this paint of Casas. And they went through the pictures of Anglada without even paying attention to them. Many of these things, we know about many of these things because of the letters that Anglada sent to a good friend of his who was a journalist in La Publicidad, which was Pere Josep Yort. That's a picture of him. And in these letters, and they were written from Paris because Anglada decided to go to Paris in 94. And he was explaining to Yort all of these difficulties that he was going through. Because in Paris, he was even uh, less known than in Barcelona. And he even had more difficulties to survive. This is one of the letters. I don't know where these letters are kept right now. But I was lucky enough to take uh, photocopies of them. And they have so much information of this life of young Anglada. He was able to go to Paris because a uh, uh, sister of Anglada had married with a very rich uh, personality in Barcelona from the Rocamora family, Josep Rocamora y Pujula, him. And from time to time, he was helping him out. He was sending him money but not as frequent as Anglada needed it. But to pay him a tribute when Roca Mora died, Anglada did this portrait of him out of his memory. It's what he remembered from him. And this is still uh, in Anglada's family now. In Paris, he got in touch with lots of painters uh, who were totally different from the paint that he used to know from Barcelona. For example, he loved the paint of Antonio Mancini. He was a great Italian painter who had lived in France. One of the first uh, uh, paints uh, of uh, Anglada uh, had the influence of Mancini, but Mancini was from another period. And Anglada, little by little, he got in touch with uh, paints that uh, were closer to uh, his period. Uh, he was a disciple of uh, René Xavier Prinet, not very well known, but not long ago there was a very complete, comprehensive monography of France about him, not long ago. He's a very very interesting painter. And uh, he was uh, a direct influence of Anglada, so much so that when he got married in Paris, he was one of the best men men in the wedding. And he also met a, a painter from Peru uh, who was young but older than him, Carlos Bacaflor. 
Carlos Baca floor opened the night Paris doors to him. He went to the casino, to Moulin Rouge, all these places that uh, represented uh, uh, a new source of inspiration of the new paint that he created at that time. Baca floor uh, had an important uh, career. He did lots of portraits. Uh, he was a great international portrait painter. He did portraits of uh, presidents of the the states, but at the beginning, he was part of the bohemian world of Paris, and that's when he met Anglada. Anglada spent from 94 to the end of the century uh, going through very tough times without being very well known. He even came to Catalonia a few times, and instead of coming to Barcelona, he was going to his uh, famous uh, hidden uh, place in Arbusias. But at the end of this period, of uh, this low period of his career, he did an exhibition of the Salon National of the, the Beauté de Beaux-Arts in Paris in 98 and 99. And he started to become a little bit more known with paints like this that, as we, we can see, are totally different from those landscapes from Monseigne that he had painted in Barcelona. And the whole concept was different. Here we can see two figures, but these two figures are very difficult to recognize because Anglada, little by little, started to focus on volumes and stains of color. And along these lines, he connected with what was becoming the most advanced approach of the European paint of that time. He was abandoning the argument to focus on paint. So every time more, all of these painters were following this path. They were following a path uh, towards pure paint or art per, by art, which uh, ended up with abstract paint. So it was about forgetting the argument, totally forgetting about that, and focusing on color contrasts, and focusing on working on paint with no story which is what was trendy in the academia world. He started in 98 uh, creating these figures. Usually there were women from uh, night, uh, the night sector in Paris. This is from 98, one of the oldest. Maybe there's something older than this, but this is the oldest that we know of. And uh, he started creating this kind of uh, paints that was linked to Art Nouveau. But he had no connection at all with the Catalan Art Nouveau at that time because he was living in Paris. And then he continued. This was the kind of paint that Anglada at that time did. And that's what made him famous worldwide in a very short period of time. So from the end of the 90s, where he uh, was not well known at all until 900, 1900, he became famous. He became famous all over Europe. He was going to Moulin Rouge. Moulin Rouge at that time. Uh, at that time was uh, a place uh, created by a Catalan man, Tarrasen, uh, Josep Pollet. And uh, Josep Pollet from Terrassa also wanted to help the different Catalan artists uh, that uh, came to Paris. They were young, not well known, and they had free tickets uh, into Moulin Rouge. So he was taking sketches of the uh, 
dancers, and then he could uh, develop that into paints. They were like exercises that he did where he proved his great ability in capturing a sudden movement. And from all of these, these paints came out. This is in Manak Museum right now. And we can see where uh, what he meant. He said that uh, the paint was a symphony of colors and that sometimes what was represented was difficult to see. And we can see this here because if we take the uh, top part of this uh, picture where there's just uh, the heads of the dancers, the rest, it's just an exercise of color and nuances. So approaching Anglada's paints is about this. It's about seeing this uh, extraordinary wisdom. Uh, for example, finding all of the nuances in white. Obviously, these paints are much better life when you reproduce them uh, on the screen. You cannot appreciate so much. He was continuing with sketches, in this case with Sangin. He did many of them. Uh, he was just uh, putting in exhibition just a few of them. I'll tell you why. And then we had these paints as a result, like Jardin de Paris. This was uh, another place. Uh, it was not Moulin Rouge. Uh, Jardin de Paris was a restaurant that was at the be beginning of Champs Elysees. And it was also uh, in the hands of Joseph Poulet. Joseph Poulet at that time was one of the large businessmen of the show sector in Paris because besides these places, he was the man who invented a lottery system, uh, also uh, a betting system. Uh, this is a man that uh, was studied afterwards. There is a biography of the 50s uh, uh, about him, but uh, he deserves an in-depth study. He created race courses, etc. He also focused on lithographies uh, as an exercise, just a little bit. And I wanted to show you this because uh, these are portraits of Lily Grenier, the same person. He, she was a good friend of Toulouse-Lautrec, a model of Toulouse-Lautrec. We don't know about the personal relationship of Toulouse-Lautrec with Anglada, but we know that they had common friends, such as Lily Grenier or Albert de Belleroche, who was uh, the person who introduce him in the lithography world. So two portraits, one with oil paint, the other one with a lithography. So Anglada was emerging. And uh, uh, important people at that time started getting interested in him. For example, René Davezac de Castera. He was an important musician, this, uh, this uh, disciple of Gabriel Fauré. And he was a musician, and he was also an aristocrat member. He was a member of a very cult family. He was from uh, Landes, and he was living in Paris. And uh, he was uh, a friend of many musicians, uh, painters, writers of that time. And through René de Castera, who was also also uh, best man in his wedding, he uh, started getting into the illustrated sector of Paris at that time. Castera was one of uh, the main uh, people who started uh, collecting his works, him and his brother. I'll talk about that later on. In 1900, uh, Anglada was starting to become famous in Paris, and uh, he was daring enough to do a new exhibition in Barcelona. You know, he had in his mind that Barcelona had not considered him well enough. So he did a new exhibition in the Paris uh, 
room, an individual exhibition. And that exhibition got a huge impact in the city. The world of Catalan Art Nouveau painting changed. Alexander de Riquet was a great artist, but he was also uh, an expert in theory, in critics. And Alexander de Riquet uh, wrote a whole article on him. And he said, among other things, that his color digressions are not uh, like uh, Bersnard's, who was a very well modern, well known painter. And it is totally different from other authors that I remember. This is a key sentence because Anglada was not imitating the uh, uh, painters that were standing out at that time. He invented his own style, always taking into account the main axis of Paris at that time. And Raymond uh, Casellas, who was the referee in in Art Nouveau's criticism, he also said in front of Salapares that the appearance of Hermen Anglada's work has been an art emotion for the beginners, a confusion for masses and a big surprise for everyone. Uh, all of uh, uh, the explanation of Casellas was uh, like paying tribute to uh, the work of uh, that artist that was from Barcelona, but no one remembered him. And in the letters that Anglada sent to Yort, when he tells Yort that uh, he wanted to do the prior exhibition in Paris, he said, look, I don't want Mr. Casellas to come to the exhibition. I don't even want to see him because uh, he was like angry at him. We don't know exactly what why, but he was angry at everything that Mm, what Art Nouveau in Catalonia meant. He was uh, talking negatively about Casas, Rosignol, Casellas. But when he came back in 1900 uh, and uh, he did this exhibition, everyone was amazed by his work. And that was a big surprise for him because he thought that uh, all of these people were enemies of him, uh, like the official representatives of Art Nouveau were enemies of him, but uh, the response was totally the contrary. And something else happened. In this exhibition in Sala Pares, that's, that was in May 1900. And that was the beginning of everything. A very young Pablo Picasso at that time, at that time Pablo Picasso was not known at all, but he was in Quatre Gats already. And he uh, changed, uh, well, he changed many times throughout his life, but he changed his style because of Anglada. So if we see the drawing on the left, this is one of the drawings that Picasso showed in Quatre Gats in his first individual exhibition, which which was a, an exhibition which, uh, you know, was totally casual because no one, you know, he was taking these on the walls himself. But in July, Picasso did an exhibition in Quatre Gats again, and that was his paint. So what happened between one or another? In May, Picasso saw Anglada's exhibition. And all of these new things that we realized and that everyone realized, uh, Casellas, Riquet, Alfredo Piso, uh, you know, the father of the drawer, uh, he said that uh, he would be our Monet. Well, Picasso also noticed that, and he changed. Uh, and he introduced in his paints this blurring of colors that we can appreciate in this uh, pastel that Santiago Rossignol bought, and it is in Cauferrat from Sitges. And the interest that Picasso had on Anglada, because uh, you know, 
uh, that was uh, totally new in Barcelona. He just came for an exhibition for a few days and he went back to Paris. And uh, Picasso had not been in Paris uh, before, so he did portraits of him uh, seven times. Uh, we have like seven portraits of Picasso from Anglada Camarasa. And these uh, depicts how fascinated he was from this Catalan painter who came from Paris with all of these innovations who had an impact in Picasso himself. And Rossignol, as we said before, he also bought uh, paints of Anglada in that exhibition. He painted, he bought, for example, this paint uh, uh, representing the night time, or this one over here where there's more light. And we can see all of these characteristics that we've been mentioning so far. All of these are like color stains, well organized, but uh, color stains. And uh, these two uh, paints are the ones that we are sure that they were in that exhibition because in the list of the newspapers, there are many paints that because of the title, we cannot know what uh, paints they're talking about. But we know about these two because they bought them there. And Picasso, afterwards, on the next year, he was doing this. And this is Picasso, uh, when he started becoming a public personality in Paris. And obviously, all of this is because he had seen Anglada's paints. Anglada was a good friend of P. de la Serra. They were painting together. They lived together in the Latin neighborhood, not far away. And another of the paints, a large paint, because Rossignol bought uh, small paints, and this was bought by a Catalan uh, person, Pere Grau Maristany. He was a wine uh, trader, and uh, the king made him a uh, count afterwards. And this is a paint from the casino in Paris. In Paris, and Pere Grau Maristany bought this paint. And uh, afterwards, it went through different collections. And it, in 2006, it was in an auction in Christie's in, in Madrid, and it became the paint that was uh, in an auction in Spain uh, that has been sold for the highest price in Spain from 2006. And at that time, we already had euros, uh, but people were thinking in pesetas. And uh, the auction was 500 million pesetas. This is the price of a French Impressionist. That's why I'm saying that the paints of Anglada in the market are always very well considered and with a very high price. All of this is the kind of paints that Anglada does in these first years of the 20th century. Sometimes he also introduces a theme element, such as this one. This one's called drug. So sometimes, depending on where the exhibition was, uh, you know, his, uh, people said that he was mm, immoral because there were references to uh, uh, drugs, uh, luxury prostitutes. Uh, she's called the Morphinum, uh, Morphine Women. It's in a Swedish collection and it was never here because uh, it went uh, to a collection in Argentina first. Or this one, for example, that ended up in the National Museum in Argentina, in Buenos Aires. So these are the kind of paints that he was doing at that time, where basically he's interested in color and light. This is Champs-Élysées from 
the brother of Castera, Carlos. Uh, he was a painter as well, and he also bought lots of paints from him. This is an extraordinary paint, and it's in the Montserrat Museum, which is a museum which is surprising because in Montserrat, every year there's like two million people going there and only 25,000 people get into the museum. In the museum in Montserrat, it's the only uh, museum in the country that has a Caravaggio and French Impressionists, and they have uh, Roussignols, uh, Mills, Roussel, such as much as Manac, and many people don't know about this. So it, it, there's not that many Anglada paints, but there's a few. This one's another one, which is uh, very important, uh, going through different uh, international collections, and it ended up in Thyssen's collection. Uh, Albert Poussin, uh, Ver Luisan, uh, uh, from uh, 04, and Ernest Steele bought this paint, a very important uh, Swedish financing guy. But he was very cult at the same time. Werner Steele was the translator of Nish into Swedish, for example. And when he died, and Tilt had a huge art collection, when he died, this collection was open to people. And nowadays in Stockholm, you can appreciate this. This is an exhibition where you can see very important paints from this period. Among the paints, this Verluisan. Uh, Luciolo in Italian. It is basically this insect with light, emitting light. And Anglada focused on Cococcio de Mimoden from this nighttime Paris, but in Paris, they, uh, there were also quite a lot of gypsy uh, dances, and he did quite a lot of paints. Uh, people thought uh, that he had gone to Andalusia to do this, but he only went to Andalusia when he was very young. I'm very sorry, I moved forward. He went to Andalusia when he was very young, when he was not really painting. So maybe he could remember a little bit of flamenco that he could have seen in Cordoba or Seville. But what he painted was inspired from what he saw in Paris, because in Paris there were these kind of shows. And at the same time, it was good for him to work with all of these colors, because this color palette was more varied and richer than the palette uh, of the characters that always use uh, pink tona tones or white tones. So he, there were lots of international collectionists who bought Anglada's paints. When Anglada became old, he became realistic. But when he was young, he preferred not to sell instead of selling at a very cheap price. So when he was selling a paint, he was also selling it at a very high price. This is also a paint from Anglada this time. They were in the markets of Paris. There's paints with animals, with markets. Uh, this was in a Biennale from 1904, and it ended up in uh, Venus, and it's still there. This is also a rooster seller. Uh, probably he painted this in Paris, but he wanted to represent somehow a rooster market that we could see at Christmas time in Catalonia. That's why the seller is wearing the Catalan hat. But this is one of the few uh, paints of Anglada with a Catalan topic. Uh, 
but you really have to pay attention to notice the red hat because uh, we just see this waterfall of colors of all of these feathers of these roosters. This is a huge paint. We took it to uh, Sitges when we did an exhibition in Kaufarrat uh, because of the anniversary of Anglada. And after being in the Abagram collection in Paris, it ended up in the Massabeu Banker collection, and now it's in the Fines Arts uh, Museum in Asturias. This is in Reina Sofia. It's a gypsy with pomegranates. Again, it's a market image with horses at the background. He liked uh, horses. A lithography. Uh, we just know 15 lithographies from him and he was not uh, 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 giving them a number. He didn't do them to sell them. Usually artists who did lithographies were writing numbers on them to sell them. No, he was just doing lithographies out of pleasure. And uh, we just know a couple of printings of them. So within the gypsy uh, theme, there's a very special paint, which is this one. It's in Hermitage in St. Petersburg. And it's a dance. It's very special because first, Anglada is trying to move his style towards an expressionism style in a moment. It's 1901. Expressionism at that time was uh, not very present in art. And uh, second, it is also special because this uh, expressionism did not really persist in his style. But it's important because Ivan Morozov bought this paint, and he was one of the two large contemporary art uh, collectionists in uh, Russia, in the Russia before the revolution. And this is why when the revolution came, the Bolshevik group uh, got the collection of Ivan Morozov. It was huge. There were Matisse, Picasso, and all of the paints of that period. And they also kept the collection of Stukin, who was the other large collectionist of contemporary art. So ever since, this was never given back to the owners. And now it is part of the public collections of arts. It was divided between Pushkin in Moscow and Hermitage in St. Petersburg. This is a paint on which Anglada afterwards did. And this is part of La Casha Foundation. This is a very interesting drawing because we can see how Anglada used to work. He starts with this middle drawing and then he sees that the paint needs to have more space. So then he's putting a paper on top of it, and uh, it transforms it into something larger, which is the, this is the definite version. Fortunately, we have lots of drawings of Anglada that are preserved, and you can see the evolution of his paints with these drawings. Another personality, another person who noticed Anglada was Serge Diaghilev. We know Diaghilev because he was well known with the Russian ballets, especially uh, afterwards with the famous uh, Russian ballets who came to Barcelona in 1917. And Diaghilev, at the beginning of the century, he was not a businessman. He was not a dance businessman. He was paying for the main Art Nouveau magazine. 
uh, in Russian, Mirkis Kuzva, the world's art. Uh, it's like Peli Broma or Yugen, the studio, Versacrum, this kind of magazines that we had in different kind of European uh, places. Mirkis Kuzva was the version in Russia. And the Aguilev was also a collectionist of Anglada's paints. But afterwards, the paints ended up everywhere. But the important thing is that in Midis Kuzva, since 1904, the Aguilev is constantly showing paints of Anglada. And this was something that was totally discovered thanks to an exhibition that Kasha Forum organized. I was the curator. It was called The World of Anglada Camarasa. It was also done in Kasha Forum in Madrid. And over there, I could ask for the collaboration of Yuri Savelyev, a Russian professor. professor. He's an architect, and he's written on architecture. But I ask him to go and check the press of that period of the year to see what was going on in Glada Camarasa. And uh, he uh, saw an article, which is in the exhibition, and uh, you can see that Amir Kuzba was constantly present, and Glada was constantly present there. And all of these paints were in black and white in Miris Kuzba, so much so that in the most modern environments of art in Russia, Anglada was super present. This is one of the few paints that we still don't know where it is. Probably it was from the collection of the Aguilev, and probably we will see it in the market in the future, because sometimes they appear in Russia. Right now, besides the, the paint in Hermitage, Pushkin has another paint of Anglada uh, that uh, was bought 20 years ago. Uh, they didn't have it from the period, and they bought it in the Russian market. So there's some paints of Anglada that might uh, reappear without us realizing. In 1904, Anglada traveled to La Bretagne. And then he went back in touch with the landscape, which is what he had been focusing so much in the Monseigne area. But this was a fast uh, trip. And this is also from La Casha Foundation. And there's not that many landscape paints like this, because he went back to Paris and he continued his career forgetting about landscape. In his exhibitions, he was always showing charcoal academia uh, paints because he wanted critic experts to talk about this. Many times these experts said that he didn't know uh, how to uh, paint. So he was showing the color symphony paint, and next to it, half a dozen of uh, paints and drawings like this to tell these experts that he did know how to paint. He was painting like that because he liked painting like that. But he was able to do something super academic if he wanted to. Between 1901 and 1904, he had exhibitions in Berlin, Paris, London, Brussels, Cannes, Venus, Munich, Dresden, and uh, three times in Berlin, three times in London, and in Brussels in Libre Esthétique, which was the large uh, Art Nouveau uh, style uh, in Belgium in Venus, La Biennale, and in Munich, uh, uh, Secessions, uh, the famous uh, societies at that time. And in Berlin, when uh, he did an exhibition in 1902, Hans Rosenhagen uh, told us something uh, that uh, we know about uh, today. He said, and he was not really talking about Anglada. He was talking about Kandinsky. And he said, Kandinsky, we can see about Kandinsky that he imitates Anglada Camarasa. We're talking about the Kandinsky 
uh, before uh, the time that he got famous. He became famous with the abstract uh, water paints uh, in uh, 1910. Uh, before, he's doing a post-symbolism paint, but uh, the critics were realizing uh, that uh, he was imitating Anglada Camarasa. And they didn't make that up because in the letters of Kandinsky with his wife, sometimes he talked about the fact that he had seen a paint of Anglada. He talks about Anglada to his wife. Also, the presence in Russia. This is the front page of Miriskusva magazine that I already mentioned. And in 1904, there is another event that was important. Besides going to Bretagne, he traveled briefly, just a couple of weeks, to Valencia. And in Valencia, he was received by Eduardo López Chavarri, an important musician uh, with a European trend, uh, more than a Valencian uh, trend. He was also a good friend of Rusignol, Mir, Mil Rusignol and Lopez Chavarri had been living together in Majorca in the famous period where Mir and Rusignol had done so many important things in Majorca in 1902. And Lopez Chavarri uh, sh shows Valencia to Anglada. And he fell in love with the popular dresses of Valencia. And he bought uh, to farmers and peasants over there to buy uh, dresses and uh, what the horses were using. And he took all of this to Paris. He was fascinated by all these garments. And he introduced all of these in his paints because he was introducing new colors to his paints paints that we had not seen with the night uh, Paris uh, theme or with the gypsy theme. And he just stayed two weeks in Valencia, but the theme of Valencia was uh, very uh, constantly present in his paints. Uh, many people say that this was the regional painting. This is what they did in Madrid. Eduardo Checharro did that. Álvaro de Sotomayor did that. Manuel Benedito. All of these painters did that. And uh, the only thing that they have in common is that they use uh, popular uh, garments. They uh, focused on the popular garments, but Anglada was not interested in anthropology. He was uh, using uh, these garments because uh, by doing that, he could work with color contrasts. Here we see these topics. This is in the National Museum of Buenos Aires. And uh, all of this is preserved. La Caixa has this because La Caixa bought 20 years after the death of Anglada. He bought to the widow uh, part of uh, his workshop, uh, paints, and also his collection of garments. So this is a part of La Caixa. And over here, we see a selection of the collections of Anglada, oriental furniture, these very colorful garments, Japanese uh, stamps. In Kasha Forum, where I was the curator of the exhibition, there was an area with all these things uh, represented, because this explains very well the aesthetic world that Anglada got the inspiration from. This is Horses Under the Rain. This is uh, done in Paris. This is when he was painting in the markets in Paris. And this was from the Cambo collection, but right now it's in a private collection. Uh, young girls from Burriana, another topic from Valencia. This in the, is in the, in the Spanish side of uh, America collection. Here, peasants in Gandia. This is a huge paint. 
if we paint it here, if we placed it here, it would totally cover this gallery over here. And this is a paint that in the exhibition of Buenos Aires in 1910, which was a very important exhibition with participation of painters from all over the world because it was commemorating an anniversary of the independence of Argentina. Well, Anglada won with this paint the single largest award of that exhibition. This is even a larger paint, and it's in Casa Forum Majorca in Palma, where there is a constant collection of the most important uh, work of Anglada, and it's all in a building of Domenech y Montare. It's the large hotel in Palma that Domenech y Montane did. And now this uh, is the headquarters of Fundación La Caixa in Mallorca. This paint is five meters. It's huge. It's uh, talking on the about the night gypsy theme. And this one is six times six meters. It's even larger. And it's also in Palma. And uh, it summarizes uh, this colorful, crazy paint, uh, 1910. And this makes us, uh, gives us the opportunity to talk about the fact that this aesthetic at that time was closely linked to the aesthetics of the Russian ballets of the Aguilev. The Russian ballets of the Aguilev were also using a decoration modernity that was based in uh, popular Russian garments. So there is like a merging of factors. But that's because from the very beginning of the century, Anglada and the most modern Russians were all going along the same lines. This is one of the portraits uh, that he did. He also did portraits in this case. This was uh, the front page of my book of Anglada from 1981. And uh, I showed this because it was in a museum. I didn't want you to think that I was trying to favor a private collect collection. But uh, American museums from time to time buy and sell uh, paints. And now this paint is in the market again. Mm, after going through Christie's and others. At the end of this period, uh, just before the First World War, Anglada got to this uh, climax uh, of this kind of paint, which is uh, like uh, the Art Nouveau uh, Swan's uh, chant. Uh, this is a portrait of Sonia de Clamery, uh, the wife of a diplomat. And uh, after moving around, it's uh, in the Reina Sofia Madrid Museum. And it's one of the main works of this period in Reina Sofia. He also did this kind of figures, natural size. He was first working on the sketches. This is just one sketch, but maybe there's like eight or uh, nine uh, sketches to do this uh, paint. And in Paris, he was successful, but he was also a teacher. He was teaching in an academia. Here we can see him with some of his students. And among his students, there were quite a few important artists, among them Marie Blanchard. And here we have a paint of Marie Blanchard, Amadeu de Sousa Cardoso, which in Portugal is considered the main name of the avant-garde in Portugal from the 20th century. And four years ago, there was a big congress in uh, Porto just focusing on him. And over there, 
they also mentioned that Anglada was his uh, teacher. This is a drawing. It's not a paint. Uh, it's the turtle dove in Valencia. Uh, it's a drawing where every time there's more colors, uh, it's more with a Baroccan style. And we need to take into account that Anglada was so famous that when he did this exhibition in Rome in 1911, and this is a large single international exhibition in Paris, uh, the exhibitions were held every two years, but this exhibition was a single exhibition to commemorate something about the Resorgimento. And Anglada was there. He was never in the Spanish pavilion because he said uh, uh, he was uh, neither in Madrid. He never went to the Madrid exhibitions either. And when he went to other places, he went to a neutral pavilion, never the Spanish pavilion. And Maxim Gorky, who was visiting Rome at that time, went there to see Anglada's paint. And he couldn't because it hadn't opened yet. And the newspapers explain that uh, they opened the Anglada's pavilion for him on purpose because he couldn't leave uh, Rome without seeing the paints of Anglada Camarasa. And it was not the family of Anglada Camarasa who were talking, who were saying this. It was the newspapers of that period that were talking about it. La Stampa de Torina has a whole article explaining this. And in Rome, afterwards, after this uh, fine arts exhibition, well, he will get the Honors Award. But in the press, they were saying that he would uh, receive this award. And in the end, the jury decided to distribute it among other painters. And it was Anglada and other painters, among them Gustav Klimt. Gustav Klimt shared the Honours Award with Anglada in the 1911 exhibition in Rome. Someone else who got an award was Ivan Mistrovic from Serbia, from Serbia because of the sculptures. And this is Anglada Camarasa in a portrait of Ivan Mistrovic. And in Paris, 1913, another important name of the Russian culture, Meyerhold, he was one of the main paradigms of uh, the Essenic world of the most modern Russia. He saw this paint of Anglada. Now it's in the Council of Barcelona, and it's in the Belague Museum of uh, Villanova la Geltrú. And without asking for permission to Anglada, because he didn't know it, he organized a whole scene work uh, in St. Petersburg focusing on this paint. This was in 1912. In 1913, they met in Paris, and they become good friends, Anglada Meyerhold. They exchange letters. They said that they would collaborate in the future, but they never collaborated because the First World War arrived and everything stopped. And then there's the Russian Revolution. And uh, although Meyerhold was well known, in uh, the Russian theater. He was a victim of Stalin. So all of this collaboration that could have happened never took place. During those years, he was also a friend of Ruben Darío in Majorca. But I'm not going to dwell into this because I'm doing bad with time. 
So we've seen until 1904. Now, from 1904 to 1914, Anglada had exhibitions in Munich, in three biennales in Venus, in Paris, in Salon National, Doton, uh, des Orientalistes, in Barcelona in 1909, in Berlin, in Schulte, in Secession, in Brussels, in London, in Zurich, Buenos Aires where he got the big award in Rome, the award from 1911, uh, Prague and Moscow. So his presence in the international world was constant, a constant presence. And fortunately, we have all of the letters uh, of invitation that are now in uh, the Manac Museum. The family is not preserving these letters anymore because at the beginning there was just one daughter, but then there were the grandchildren and then the great grandchildren, and it was difficult to have access to these letters. But finally, these letters are in Manac Museum, and uh, you can see all of the details in these letters. I'm glad that never wanted to be part of the contest. Uh, he wanted to be out of the contest, and only in Rome or Buenos Aires, for whatever reason, he was part of the contest and he got the awards. Then the First World War arrives. He realizes that he won't have exhibitions in Europe because of the war. Uh, so he focused on Spain. He had a large exhibition in Barcelona, not small exhibitions in Salapares. This was a great exhibition in the Fine Arts uh, uh, Palace. It was anthologic, uh, uh, opened by Enric Granados. And uh, it is also a very clear aesthetic contact because Enric Granados was also inspired uh, in uh, Hispanic folklore elements. I'm glad I did that. And there is another element of interest. Uh, Granados uh, is the last thing that he does here before going to New York. And uh, on his way back, he died because of a torpedo of uh, a German uh, boat. So Granados uh, was Catalan from Lleida. He was part of Art Nouveau. And uh, this was like the farewell. Uh, when he was present in the Anglada exhibition. Now, Jenny Dors and Anglada, although the paint of Anglada and uh, the movement of Ors don't go hand in hand, and Jenny Dors, he was very sensitive to the fact that uh, Anglada was a Catalan who was famous all over the world. So he respected him a lot. He was going to his exhibitions, and Anglada was going to his conferences. But in 1915, Eugenie Dors wrote an article, and he said, look, all of these large uh, portraits uh, were part of an art that uh, it was uh, beautifully feverish before dying. So so Eugenie Dors uh, realized that that was in its climax, in uh, its uh, climax, but uh, he had the intuition that this would finish. And after the First World War, all of this aesthetic did disappear. And Glada was a left wing guy, although. Uh, his audience was the aristocracy. He signed the manifesto of the intellectual representatives in Spain, and uh, he was in the Allies group in the First World War. And here we have part of the list of the people who signed Alomar, Azaña, Carné, Rusignol, Unamuno, among them, Anglada. Between 1915 and 1919, he couldn't do any exhibitions in Europe. He did uh, the exhibition in Barcelona, a large exhibition in Madrid, 
one in Buenos Aires and in Bilbao in 1919 uh, that was already being prepared in the last years of the war. But he discovered Majorca, and in Majorca he got in touch with the paints there, such as Antoni Gelabert, an extraordinary painter, and they became good friends. Uh, the only problem with Gelabert is that he was totally isolated in Majorca. He did travel, but uh, he was an excellent painter. And uh, in Majorca, Anglada created, without wanting it, an intellectual group of South American guys who were had been students of his in his academia in Paris. Here we have Tito Cittadini, this one on the left, Gregorio López Naín, an important painter of these times, Ricardo Guiraldes, who would be, because he hadn't published his uh, uh, work at that time, but he would become one of the reference writers of literature in Argentina and Anglada, here at the top, Fález Garaño, another important painter at that time. So he created this world over there with many painters, these painters and others, because in this picture we see a few, but there are others. Roberto Montenegro, who was Mexican, Roberto Ramagé, quite a few of them. And with them, he created what uh, was known as the Pollensa School. They were in the Pollensa Harbor. Anglada stayed in Pollensa. He stayed there to live forever. And this Pollensa School is a school of uh, foreign uh, painters because not even Gelabert was part of the Pollensa School. And he created a very specific world there, quite curious. And it's very closed. And also there was the World War, obviously. So it was impossible for all of these artists to be able to go back to Argentina. And they couldn't move. They couldn't become well known in Europe. So it was closed in uh, Majorca. And three or four years before the French surrealist painters invented uh, this idea of drawing with folded papers, four or five artists, and then to unfold them, and then uh, they could see what the drawing was. They were already doing this in Majorca. There were already things like that in the Pollensa School, but they were not copying the surrealistic uh, uh, painters. They invented it themselves. And probably the surreal uh, painters didn't know about this either. These were two works of that time. I need to cover this quickly. This is a work from Cittadini. Cittadini stayed there forever. He died, and Roberto Montenegro from Mexico, after uh, some years, he went back to Mexico. He continued with the portraits. Uh, this was uh, the woman of the Raldes, and uh, he was uh, the wife of Rildaldes. Uh, and here we see this topic of Formento, because the Pollensa uh, harbor, there was the Formanto uh, area. Yes, and this is intact. Uh, when you walk in Formanto, there's no houses. You can see nature uh, in pure uh, state. Well, Majorca is covered with tourism, but some places aren't. One of these places is Formanto. 
And the exhibit he did in Madrid in 1916, he did that after receiving this uh, letter, which is still preserved. And Glava was well known all over the world, and he had never done an exhibition in Madrid. So the cultural entities in Madrid uh, sent him uh, a letter, and, uh, and they told him, come to Madrid because we don't know you, and you're a Spanish well-known personality. And this is signed by Pérez Galdós, Romero de Torres, Azorín, Marañón, Pío Baroja, Ramón Gómez de la Serna, Vallinclán, Ortega y Gasset, Martínez Sierra. So all of the generation of 98, I'm only missing Antonio Machado, that maybe that day he was not there, but the rest were signing there and others who were not from the 98 generation. And Anglada went there uh, to do this large exhibition in El Retiro and that also had a huge impact. But there was a lot of controversy because the people in Madrid uh, didn't have that taste for modernity that we had in Barcelona. And many people criticized him because they considered that his paint, uh, paintings were too far away from canons. In Majorca, Anglada was happy, and he ended up buying a house uh, just uh, next to the sea. His daughter is still living there. Uh, it's in Pollensa. It's fantastic. He was a strong guy. He was swimming. He was diving. He was swimming uh, until a bergucci, and. Uh, he realized that he had already done his worldwide uh, career, and he was aware that he would not go back to that Belle Epoque. It was over. So with uh, the inspiration of the landscape from Majorca, he applied that to his aesthetics. So he did landscapes, but it was artificial, colorful, as the paints from his uh, paints in Paris, such as, for example, these almond trees that Cambo bought. Uh, Cambo uh, bought uh, uh, many of his paints, and he was his lawyer and his client as well, because he bought quite a lot of his paints, and many of the paints are still in his hands. This is part of the Cambo collection with this huge paint of Anglada, which is a mermaid at the bottom of the sea, which is one of the topics of Anglada and Majorca. This is in uh, Manac Museum uh, with hackberry trees. Uh, it's this light explosion uh, inspired in Majorca. And uh, the states were not setting the artistic cultural laws. The states were like a territory that was quite interesting, but uh, far away, overseas. But uh, Anglada was uh, invited to uh, do an exhibition there, but he was not interested in going there. So much so that the president of the Carnegie Institute in Pittsburgh, which was this guy over here, and he was a new president because the Carnegie Institute had been up and running for a long time. But this gentleman was a new modern director. So he said, look, I'm going to go to Majorca to convince this guy. And he went to Majorca. And here we have Anglada without the beard. He was not in Art Nouveau. And Alexander convinced him to go to the Pittsburgh exhibition from 29. And yeah, this was already in 24. And uh, that year, Anglada went there also without participating in a contest, and he went there personally as a member of the jury. 
and uh, Carnegie Institute uh, uh, took care of a large uh, exhibition of painters from all over Europe, and they were doing an itinerary through different uh, cities in the state. Here we have Margaret Palmer and Glada. Margaret Palmer was the person who took uh, care of all of the tasks so that uh, the painters could reach agreements uh, uh, with the institutes in uh, America. She was the agent of the Carnegie Institute. He's there with Anglada and uh, Cittadini, who stayed all of his life in Majorca. Anglada was painting. Uh, he loves uh, pine trees, the pine trees from Formanto, and also Miquel Costa y Llovera. Uh, did a very famous uh, poem out of this paint. And he also introduced the underwater theme. Anglada is totally far away from any European school. Anglada is just following his own style here. He was swimming, diving, and he saw the uh, sea bottom. So he uh, had a glass bottom boat so that he could see the sea bottoms. And he got the inspiration. And he did uh, paints of uh, the sea bottom from the 20s. This is also from 1920s. And as you can see, aesthetically, it's the same thing that he had always done. Uh, but the theme was different. It was the sea bottom. In the Anglo-Saxon world, he was now more well known because he had exhibitions in the States. So that's why the big first monography on his work was published in London. It's a book from Hutchinson Harris. He was not an art historian. He was a sociologist, a philosopher, but he did a book, a thick book, that we still have as a reference right now. And it's a very well done book. Uh, Hutchinson Harris was from the academia world. He was from Cambridge, I think. But he spent some time living in Majorca. He translated uh, uh, into English, uh, Alpida Formanto, for example, and Anglada met him personally. And this is why the book is so rich, because he got direct information from Anglada. Anglada also got in touch with people such as Miguel Capjomp, that many people don't know who he is, but he's a great piano player from Majorca. And most of his career, he was in Austria. And uh, he was a very important teacher, so much so that Arthur Rubinstein, when he was interviewed, he always said that in Vienna, he was following Mikhail Capion. So Mikhail Capion was uh, from uh, Polensa and he sold a plot to Anglada where he widened his house. And then he also bought another plot and he planted lots of vegetable spices uh, and he uh, had lots of flowers. And then he opened another theme, which was these bouquets of flowers. And all of these flowers were flowers that he was growing himself in his garden. Majorca themes, as you can see over here. He also did portraits such as Gertrude Lawrence, the cinema actress and singer, very famous and well known. And she went to Pollensa for Anglada to do a portrait from her. 
we just have the large sketch of it because the portrait, it's her who uh, kept it, and we don't know where it is right now. Another portrait, Frances Coster, the prime minister, and between 1924 and the Civil War, all of the exhibitions are mostly done in the States. Many in Pittsburgh, Washington, New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, Dallas, Philadelphia, Cleveland, among many others. And it was always done through these organization that was leadered by the Carnegie Institute. Other exhibitions in Barcelona, he had the honor room in the international exhibition in 1929. In London with the book, he did an exhibition in Leicester's gallery in 1929 and the next year in Liverpool. But then the Civil War started and he was in Barcelona because he had an exhibition in Pinacoteca and uh, uh, Anglada was uh, Republican and uh, he stayed in Barcelona because in Majorca Franco was very powerful so he wanted to do a paint of the disasters uh, of the war. But we just have sketches of this because he never ended up doing the paint. And then there were difficult times uh, for him. He was living in a hotel in Barcelona, in Hotel Novel. It still exists uh, because he didn't have a house in Barcelona. He got married the third time in Majorca in the last years before the war, and he had a little kid that died here in Barcelona because he got an infection, and uh, they couldn't find medication to cure uh, him. He just had one daughter alive, which is the one that's still alive. And the Catalan government in 1937, a year after the war started, invited him to go to the monastery in Montserrat. Montserrat, anarchists uh, killed uh, lots of monks uh, there. The Catalan government had to use the monastery to stop all of that. So he used the monastery as an empty cult place and there were important foreign visitors, and uh, when politicians came, they were living there. There were even uh, the courts of the Republica that were done there, and I'm glad I was living there, and also other personalities from the cultural world. And he stayed. He stayed there a whole year and maybe nearly two years, 37, 38. Uh, and this was his very last uh, period because the landscape of Montserrat really uh, fit with his aesthetics. All of this idea of these large rocks, the nuances of the uh, greens, uh, so he did like uh, 50 important paints in Montserrat and also lots of uh, sketches and drawings, which are these over here. And this is his uh, last uh, big period. And then uh, Franco got into Barcelona on the 26th of January and uh, Anglada, uh, went to the exile at the end of uh, January, together with Carlos Riva, Rubiri, Virgili, and Posi Pages, and uh, also many others. And in France, uh, he was well known. Uh, so many ended up in a concentration camp, but Anglada made it possible to live without luxury, but uh, he ended up living in Pour les Eaux, a village in France, and he continued painting. He met Ferran Callameras, the writer over there, 
and uh, he was the one who did uh, the biography of Giuseppe Boulier. And Glada probably also explained things to him about Giuseppe Boulier. This book is very interesting. It's from 1959. It hasn't been re-edited, but Giuseppe Boulier is a unique character. So he met people from the Catalan exile, but he didn't have time to do much because in France, the Second World War uh, started. And uh, he was not sensitive uh, with the French landscape. He was with Majorca and Montserrat landscape, but not with the French landscape. This is one of the few real themes of a French landscapes. His He was there from 1939 to 1948, lots of years in the exile. Miró, in 1941, was already in Majorca. And Glada didn't come back until 1948. So he did um, a temporary things. He used drawings that uh, he had in sketches, and he created paints of uh, themes from Majorca, but he worked out of his memory. And uh, he was there for many years. And then in 1948, he came back. He did a new exhibition. Well, he did one in 1947 before arriving with some uh, paints that uh, there were here in 48. It was new paint, 52, 55 in Palma, in Pittsburgh as well, and in Buenos Aires as well. In Argentina, he had lots of students. So in Argentina, there were lots of his paints, although he never ended up there. The last years of his life, he was uh, really uh, very old, but he was still painting with very good quality. He did this kind of painting, which obviously it was not uh, lively. He was not diving at that time because he was very old. But he did this in 1948, 1950, or this uh, landscape from Boker, which is the paint that he gave as a present to the San Fernando Academy in Madrid when he was appointed as a, a Honor Academia member when he came back from the exile. He had a domestic accident, not too important, but that ended up with his career from 1953. This is his last paint. Here we can see the sketch. It's in Formento, the water uh, tower, the watchtower, and he died in 1959 in Pollensa. And this is the whole life of this very rich uh, personality, Camarasa. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fombona. It has been a very comprehensive presentation. I really enjoyed it. I don't know about you, but I thought it was super interesting. We have this rolling mic, so this is the time uh, to ask questions uh, uh, to uh, Dr. Fombona before he leaves. Maybe they're tired because I've been talking for more than an hour and a half. But anyway, you've been a stoic and you've uh, stayed here until the end. Is this working better? Oh, yes, it's working better. OK, so no questions. No questions? Oh, yes, there's a question here. Well, I would like to say that these uh, people over here uh, edit the Coup de Fouet uh, 
magazine, only on Art Nouveau, very well illustrated. And it's not just uh, Art Nouveau from Catalonia. Also, there's the one from Belgium, from Germany. They've been doing this magazine for, for, for a long, long time. And I haven't collaborated there. Uh, I... I do recommend you this magazine because the foreign collaborators are the people who know lots about it. Yet it's a privilege that we have. And also, most of the people who write there are great experts. With Anglada Camarasa, we've had a collaboration of uh, Frances von Bona. Many people collaborate there for free. They don't even charge us for that. So it's a privilege that we have. You had a question over here? Yes, uh, congratulations. Uh, you've got a, a great memory. Well, I started studying Anglada in 1974, and the book was published in 1981. Lots uh, happened from the very beginning. He's like a member of my family, you know. Uh, his daughter looks at me and he says, oh, look, here he comes again. And I say, no, I'm like the father of your father. That's what I tell her. He was contemporary to Soroya. He didn't have a relationship with Soroya. Well, they knew each other. They knew each other, but they didn't have much of a relationship. And uh, they were totally different aesthetic worlds because Soroya was a painter that came from the realistic tradition of the 19th century, you know, with lots of colors, but very loyal to uh, realism. And Anglada, as we saw, you know, he forgot realism to just uh, imagine different shapes. He did have a good relationship with uh, Zuluaga, though. Anglad and Zuluaga didn't agree with the official Spanish world. And Soroya was really a member of this world. And they always said that they didn't want to participate in Spanish exhibition because they were dominated by people from Valencia, Soroya and Belliure. Both of them were in all of the juries, and they were involved in all of the fine arts world. And although they were not uh, enemies, because they weren't enemies, they didn't share the same world. No. There was no good feeling among them. No, no good feeling. But they both went to America because Soroya, yeah, with Huntington, yes. Anglada with Huntington, yes, it was the same period. Anglada with Huntington only did this uh, uh, paint of the Burriana girls. But to Soroya, Huntington asked him to do uh, a whole room of mural paints in 1913. I wanted to ask how such a world famous painter who had been in Europe in exhibitions and in the States, how could be, how can he be so not known in Catalonia, in Barcelona, and in Spain? Because uh, the masses don't know him. People in Barcelona don't know him from my point of view. People don't know him. I don't understand. I've never studied him at school, for example, or at university. No one taught me about him. Well, this is just fashion. OK, fashion. But I have studied the French Impressionists, Expressionists. Uh, and this gentleman had never been mentioned to me in school. And his paints are fascinating. Yeah, but I already told you that in the market, 
things are totally different because when uh, paint from Anglada appears, people will buy it or sometimes they cannot buy it because of the very high price it has. So it's a curiosity. Maybe out there in the street, Anglada is not well known. Although Mafre did a great exhibition of Anglada 20 years ago, La Casha has done more than one exhibition. In 1981, they did an exhibition that was done in Barcelona, Madrid, and Palma. And seven or eight years ago, we had this one of the world of Anglada Camarasa that was always, I was also the curator there. So, Exhibitions have been done and they have been successful, but many times, I don't know, fame comes and goes and popularity responds to some mechanisms that maybe the marketing world has not totally studied them. However, I can tell you that in the market world, People know about Anglada because you can buy a Rusignol or a Casas paint and uh, Anglada's paint will always be more expensive. Will always be more expensive. Yeah, but Rusignol and Casas, I know them. They taught me about them. I don't know exactly how to express it, but I think that uh, from the point of view of the evolution, you know, because he went to Paris, he learned from the French Impressionism, and then he evolved towards an Expressionism. I think that all of this is so interesting, but he's not well known. I didn't know this Catalan painter too well. Yeah, it's true, but I don't know, a sociologist maybe should have to explain why this happens, because the people from the cultural world, we are poor souls. If we knew about this, we would be famous. Uh, if we knew what we had to do to become famous. Well, anyway, I really enjoyed it a lot. Thank you very much. I would like to give a partial hypothesis. Maybe the themes that Anglada Camarasa chose, for example, the flamenco music, uh, the regional garments of Valencia, the gypsies, maybe the Catalan mentality or the pro-democratic uh, mentality, maybe associated this to Francoism, you know, flamenco, the regional garments. Maybe there was a rejection. Yeah, maybe, but in Europe, uh, he was very famous, and people don't know about this. And uh, it, now there is paints of him in Russia, Belgium, Sweden, and uh, at that time, uh, people were buying them, and now maybe people wouldn't buy them. Uh, I think that it was him, himself as well. You know, with the First World War, it was a, a huge shock for him. And thank God that Americans wanted him to go there for the exhibitions. When he went there, he went there as an honor guest. The previous year, Pierre Bonnard had been the uh, honor guest. And the next year, it was Claude Monet, the honor guest, who was still alive. So. He was at that level. But with time, these things change. But this doesn't mean that he doesn't have an intrinsic value. This means that there was a change in the cultural uh, knowledge of this uh, character. How many paints did he paint? Because he did lots. No, no, he was very slow painting because many of these pictures, for example, this picture over here, it's uh, 
It's a huge picture, and it's not one of the largest paint. He could be a couple of years painting just one paint. In my catalog, and my catalog was published in 1981, and it was a thousand paints, approx. But that's not a lot, because there are some painters that have 3,000, 4,000 paints, and I've cataloged 300 more ever since. And uh, I think that uh, I've cataloged most of his important paints. Maybe some minor paints are still not cataloged. But he didn't do many, many, many things because he spent time in his paints. And he was insisting a lot. For example, Anglada, for those paints that he didn't sell and he uh, kept to himself, he was painting them 30 years after having painted them for the first time. He was really insisting. He was painting on top of it. So if you're lucky and you have an old picture, you can compare and you can see how the paint has changed. I'm quite intrigued with the underwater paints. Anglada Camarasa was the first one who did this, who, who was really focusing in the underwater world. Yeah, I've seen a few besides Anglada Camarasa, but yeah, it's what I told you. Uh, he was not part of any school at that time. He was uh, not part of the main uh, schools. So that's why, uh, you know, he was in the States, etc. But he didn't really became uh, uh, you know, uh, super insisting on that theme. Any further questions? No more questions? Okay, then, we'll call it a day. Thank you very much, Dr. Fombona.